Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we're looking around in 144 different nations looking at those thousand best practices, technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we add 2 billion new people to the planet by 2050, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people with the basic infrastructure, plus the food, the fuel, the fiber, the water, everything that they need? And a young man who's sitting right beside me that's uh, been with us before, uh, he spends a lot of time not only thinking about all this and reading about it, uh, but also doing something about it. This is Dr. Linton. He goes by Lynn Wells the second. He's coordinator for Star Tides program and he's executive advisor for the C4I and Cyber Center at the Virgin O School of Engineering at George Mason University and also the president of the Global Resilience Strategies. And Lynn, welcome back. It's good to be back. Thanks, Always Sam. good to have you back. Tell us what does Star Tides actually uh, stand for? What does it mean? And then also, what is the mission and the vision as far as Star Tides is concerned? So, Tides is a global knowledge sharing network. Uh, the name is Transformative Innovation for Development and Emergency Support. So, it began by supporting four missions building the capacity of partners, domestic and foreign disaster relief, and then uh, peacekeeping and stability operations. The STAR is actually the network that shares the information. So STAR Tides is global knowledge sharing information about building sustainable resilience. Now, when you're looking at the STAR Tides and, you know, what it's doing, when did it actually start? And then how has it evolved? Because you've actually been growing this for a number of years that I've known you, and it just keeps like, it just keeps expanding. So STAR Tides began as a Department of Defense program in 2007 as TIDES, Transformative Innovation, Development and Support. And that was these four Defense Department mission areas. But because the network only shares knowledge, it doesn't bend metal, it doesn't have contracts, it doesn't favor one company over another, the General Counsel said, you can talk to most anybody about anything on this network. So the network has now grown to several thousand nodes, ranging from universities in Asia to non-governmental organizations in Europe and Africa, to the Red Cross, parts of the U.S. government. It really is public and private, whole of government, transnational. What's different now, what's particularly different now, is that uh, uh, earlier this year, actually late last year, George Mason University has established something called a Community Resilience Laboratory. And so it was, Star Tides was just about sharing knowledge. Mm -hmm. The laboratory now that's it focused on Pacific's projects like Appalachia or Puerto Rico or whatever. Yeah, I and mean, we're going to talk about some of those, but looking at this chart here, this really goes into the very essence as far as Star Tides is concerned. Go through these because these are critically important, uh, not only as far as the Institute and also your laboratory, but how do we service people all over the globe and anticipate the future? So one of the things that really frustrated me when I was with the Department of Defense was you got very channelized. I was focused on information technology. It was very hard to get people to you know, talk seriously about shelter or water or power or things like that. And so one of the advantages of working at National Defense University in 2007 is you could focus on these multiple infrastructures. So these have evolved, and of course George Mason is an excellent place to do this also. So we look at power. Uh, we look at uh, shelter, we look at so-called WASH, water and sanitation, uh, we look at agriculture and food security, we look at information and communications technologies, and we also look at uh, public health, nutrition, and integrated solar and combustion cooking. Yeah, now looking at this, this you talk about this worldwide, all these nodes that you're uh, connected to and thousands of these all over. Uh, but this is a very wide network that you have. You're covering mm -hmm. all the continents, all the way down to Antarctica and everything in the Arctic Circle. So, in bringing in and inviting these, do they willingly come in? You entice them to come in? How do people become part of this and uh, then feel like that they can actually contribute? Sure, there's no, uh, there's no entry fee or whatever to join. It's totally voluntary. Uh, an example of how Star Tides works is that a couple of years ago, um, the embassy in Washington of Iraq 
asked us to think about refugee populations in uh, around Basra, Basra and Baghdad, and what could we do to support. So I went out to the network and said, did anybody have any inputs? In a week, we got 80 different inputs. Mm. Some people said, I served in Iraq, I'd like to keep supporting. Others said, I have a technology I'd like to try to sell. Others said, whatever. And so, b but the heart of this is this has to be a bottom-up local community pull. It doesn't do any good for us to go in and try to impose our solution on this. So my point was back to the Iraqis. Here are some people that could help. Uh, who is your point of contact and what do you need from us? And we never were able to get that worked out. But on the other hand, in Appalachia, where we've been working, they've said we need three things. We need clean water. Our streams are so polluted. We need uh, high energy efficiency, low cost shelter, Many people live in trailers, cheap to buy impossible heat, and we need broadband to keep the young people here, telemedicine, things like that. So the first part is to listen. How do you get the narrative from the village up, community up? The second part is the engineers do their thing, but if they go back down with differential equations and complicated diagrams, they've lost the argument there. So who can translate the language of the village to the systems thinkers and then the system solutions back to the community? Yeah, and looking at these uh, different examples here, communities all over the globe that you've been working with, and uh, very successfully so, and for many years now, as you've been involved in that. But looking at the, some of the technologies, I mean, this is really a technology, in a sense, rich environment that you've created, and it just keeps expanding. So looking at these various technologies, uh, what are you looking for, and what kind of technologies seem to fit best in the Star Tides model? going forward, or is it everybody comes and then let people select their own? I think one of the things to keep in mind is if you have some kind of capability that's doubling say, every 18 months, as computing power per unit cost is, uh, in a year and a half you have 100% more capability. But in five years it's 900%, in 10 years it's 10,000%, 15 years it's 100,000% capability. Now that may level off, it may accelerate, it may be a step function change like quantum computing, but there's no way that linear projections based on where we are now can work. So part of our thinking in Sartai is how do you get people to think about that? Simple example is SkyFi, okay, the internet from space or near space. Uh, I don't know which will win, uh, Google's balloons or small sats or drones, but you're gonna have this capability. And we should be thinking now about what that means for the people if you don't have to build these big infrastructures mm -hmm. and you can just um, draw on it from, uh, as an available resource. Yeah, and the whole thing about this is that people willingly want to be part of this because they understand, and most of these people are true humanitarians. Mm -hmm. So no matter whether they're coming out of a research institute, off of a university campus, out of uh, you know K-12 even right. case, uh, or are they coming out of private business, they really want to contribute to society. Absolutely. So how do you engage them so that they feel like that they really are a part of the Star Tides network and they in turn then have a chance to go out and share whatever it is that they have so you know, through all these different nodes that you have? So several different ways. First of all, we have an annual technology demonstration. Which, uh, which is our 12th year now, and we try to bring together examples of some of these technologies. Uh, there are, it's always an open field situation, so all power is off-grid, generated by the solar and wind power companies. Uh, communications are live, uh, so the PowerPoint not welcome, static display not welcome, bring us things that work. Uh, people say, what happens if it rains? And the answer is, it's disaster relief, bring a raincoat. Uh, and so most of the people who come every year come back because they find value in that. And, and also the networking. I mean, the networking in you know this environment is really rich, and, and each one is saying, okay, when they go back, you know, they're saying, okay, we're we're doing the satellite uh, telecommunications and all that. We have all these advanced keyboards, but they're also looking at housing, at uh, solar water, uh, sanitation, all these other kinds of things. Yeah, we actually had a situation this spring at George Mason where a group of system engineering students did their master's capstone project on an Appalachia village community of trying to integrate power and shelter and broadband to build a community that could attract young people or retirees or maybe some people who worked in the city but weren't living there. And again, it's that integrated system thinking type of approach that we try to uh, encourage. Now the thing about it, if you look at this, uh, this uh, you know, hut here, this is something that's uh, very simple, 
but yet it's profound is mm -hmm. what it can do for people that through a disaster like in Puerto Rico or you know in Indonesia and places like that. So how simple are these technologies? Is this something that you want to be able to be able to show up and be able to put it out there and it's functioning within a short period of time? Or is this something that's going to be there long lasting and uh, permanent? I think there's a mix. I mean, first of all, realize that sociology always tops technology. And so how do you put together solutions that work for people in their worlds with their resources? It doesn't go in, doesn't work for us to show up with, you know, thousand dollar iPhones and things like that if you're dealing with, uh, you know, jerry cans of water. So uh, how do you find a solution that works for the community? And that's why the Community Resilience Laboratory is focused on underserved communities to do two things, improve opportunities and build sustainable resilience. So in that, it might be that broadband, uh, I mean, young people would want 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second in order to be able to be entrepreneurs and stay where they want. On the other hand, people might want um, pretty low-tech uh, water solutions, say. Right. Yeah, we're going to go back to this, Mike. I want to, we're just about out of time, mm -hmm. as we always are, <laughs> we're going to get together. But looking at these areas here, as far as the food, the shelter, and all that, how does all of this, and people know about this, that that are in Puerto Rico and devastation of the whole island, how does Star Tides plug into that? Or do you have intermediate areas that are actually the bridges into these communities? Well, the, the bridges are absolutely key. I mean, th this has to be a locally led uh, implementation. There can be a global thinking. The lab ties these infrastructures together, things globally, but the implementation has to be local and has to be done through people who are trusted in the community. And so it may be the people trusted. We find often young people in faith-based organizations are, are reliable partners. Uh, people who've spent, been willing to put skin in the game and spend a lot of time on the ground. So our solution to say, these are the things that are available. What makes sense to you? And then have them go out and reach to members of the Star Tides Network and figure out what actually gets implemented. Fantastic. Well, we're going out on this. What do you see for the expansion of this continued expansion, I should say, of Star Tides over the next 5, 10, 15 years? I, I think it will uh, increasingly al align itself with the Community Resilience Lab to be focused on different projects. For example, people in Puerto Rico worried about hurricanes, people in Appalachia are not worried about hurricanes. You focus on the needs of the community and fold the Star Tides into it. That's fantastic. This is Dr. Dr. Uh, Linton goes by Lynn Wells II, coordinator, Star Tides program, executive advisor, C4I, and a uh, very scientific uh, term there, Cyber Center, uh, Vagino School of Engineering, George Mesa, as we create the Emerald Planet. Gotcha. <laughs> I surrender, I surrender. All right, pal. Get ready for the day, buddy. Hey, Dad. Hey, Dad. Do we have a gun? What's up? Do we have a gun? Hmm. Maybe you can make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it cross-referencing travel sites, and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... <laughs> Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Last night at high school... I tried Oxy at a couple of parties. I thought I had it under control. I didn't know it'd be this addictive. I didn't know how far I'd go to get more. <sighs> Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. What to expect when you're expecting? Like here? A teenager. Today, I'm going to show you how to teen-proof your home. First step, hide the car keys. Preferably somewhere they would never look. Challenges will come up. Be ready for them. Hi, honey. Ready for the mom. You don't use mannequins in the mannequin challenge. You don't have to know it all to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. <laughs> Hmm. 
Bring it back to the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and look, looking around the globe, we're trying to find those thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, products, and the processes, of course, as we move through the 21st century. At an Emerald Planet, we're always looking for the new ways to have solutions to deal with disasters and at the same time to allow society to move forward at a very steady pace as it's going to be moving towards 2050 and we have a planet of about 9 billion people. But I have a gentleman sitting right beside me who actually had to face the devastation in Puerto Rico where the whole country was almost totally destroyed and he decided he was going to do something about it. And uh, we brought him in today to really talk about this. This is uh, Melvin. He goes by Mel Cordova. He's the founder of Project Koki. And also the, uh, he's the lead for the people-centered internet in Puerto Rico. Yes, sir. And Mel, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Thank glad you for be being here. And this uh, term, uh, Koki, we got this in uh, as far as your uh, logo is concerned. And we're going to show Koki in just a minute. Okay. But tell us a little bit about that. Well, let me tell you about Project Coqui. Um, we were, you know, we have family in Puerto Rico. My wife uh, has her father, uh, my father there. And um, we believe the response uh, to the magnitude of the event was limited and it was slow. Uh, I lost contact with my father for 13 days. And uh, you can only imagine. And uh, I was going to do something about it. So first of all, I decided to write letters to Congress. I sent them an analysis of comparing the magnitude of the event in Puerto Rico with the response that they provided to Haiti back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And um, the response to Haiti was very significant. Of course, it was a very serious event, but for hours, uh, I felt it was limited. So I had to do something about it. We call it Project Coqui because the Coqui represents to leapfrog from the present to a new future. And that's what it shows. Um, it's a Puerto Rico that after the devastation is a white canvas. Mm -hmm. So we have to innovate. Yeah, and we're actually showing the, the little frog here, the coqui itself. And the, the interesting thing about this is this is actually one of those uh, bellwether types of animals that tells you whether the environment is good, bad, or getting worse. Okay. And so this is something that's uh, very, very important. So you were leapfrogging. And let's catch people up on what was the actual devastation in Puerto Rico. And then we're going to start talking about some of the solutions. But we have some images here that you shared sure. with us that you actually uh, brought in and you saw yourself. Absolutely. So what are we, so what are we looking at as far uh, as the devastation? The photo on the left, those are children riding bicycles. They don't have power. They don't have internet. So you see the kids in the street. The people um, just sitting down on by the sidewalk, just telling stories, just like in the old times. Um, the photo on the right is a bathroom, it's a toilet in the middle of the road because uh, people needed to go somewhere, mm -hmm. and there was there were no toilets. Yeah, and it's just amazing too. I mean, everything was destroyed. The banking, I mean, all the basic uh, services. Mm -hmm actually destroyed yes, and so this is a, a long line of people as far as the bank yeah. but what was the the devastation as far as the finances because people couldn't get sure. to the bank even if they had money they sure. couldn't access it sure uh, it was a cash economy uh, in this photo here we see over 200 people online going to an ATM uh, sometimes people will wait before the bank opened for three hours and uh, the, they will run out of power and then you, you just have to re return the following day uh, when I went to Puerto Rico, I took 8,000, 800,000 cash, and I was helping many people in need because I didn't have money. In addition to the banking, it's important to know uh, a friend of mine is a doctor, and the pharmacies could not release uh, medication because they didn't have the prescriptions. So he was just trusting the people to mm -hmm. come in to his home late at night, and he would write hand prescriptions and issue them. Yeah, and th this photograph too, people don't realize that in most cases, people don't even have access to water. 
Yes, sir. You know, water is life. Yes, sir. And you're completely surrounded by water. You know, it, there's a yeah. lot of water throughout the nation. And so you have a person standing here with just, you know, two plastic bottles trying to get yeah. enough water to uh, survive. I mean, it, the amount of devastation is just absolutely mm -hmm. unbelievable. Yes, sir. But you're looking at this from the standpoint of uh, something that's going beyond what we're seeing here right now to where actually you, you were taking something with you that was going to give faith to the people, but actually start connecting people so they could be helping each other because obviously in many cases the government wasn't doing it. So people were doing it by, you know, family and also by community. Yes, sir. So what did, what was this morphing into? We started, um, we didn't know what we were really getting into. We just had to lean forward and help and, and communicate. Um, I made phone calls to get a helicopter to send medical aid to a hospital uh, through connections. Um, I visited people that lost everything and I asked them what they were doing, how they spend their day, they say crying, and uh, schools closed, um, um, stores closed. It was really sad. It was very depressing. You could see the trees that survived with no leaves. Mm -hmm. you know, so yeah, it was uh, it's just amazing. But you have something that's called the people-centered internet. Tell us about that. And this is something that originated with yes, you know a good friend of ours yeah. with uh, Emerald Planet. Uh, yes, sir. So after my second trip, my first trip I did a video. The second trip I did a um, after-action report because people were giving me donations and I was responsible to them. Uh, to tell them how I was uh, delivering the aid. And uh, one of the persons that first contacted me was David Bray. And uh, he said, Melvin, can I share this? You're doing good work. Can I share this with other people in my network? I said, please go ahead. And uh, then shortly after, I get contacted by Mei Ling Fong. She's a pioneer behind CRM. And then I get put in touch with uh, Mr. Vinton Cerf. Yeah. He's one of the co-founders of the internet. And we run to uh, leave this picture up here because he's actually been on the Emerald Planet TV. And okay. uh, he's, a, he's a good yeah. friend of everyone's here yeah. at uh, this TV. Yeah, so, so, so they, ha they are an international coalition that want to, um, they call themselves change agents. You know, uh, the velocity and complexity of technology, technology change is dramatic. Uh, we need to embrace it. And um, uh, so we can use the internet for social good. And that is, that is what they're trying to do. And they partnered with me to help Puerto Rico. Uh, they have visited Puerto Rico a couple of times. And um, uh, we are collecting problem sets. We are identifying solutions. We are creating new models to advance the future of the internet and do it in Puerto Rico. Now looking at this diagram here, tell us how all this fits into the people-centered internet and how is the impact as far um, as the, the people right now? So um, that, that comes from, uh, yeah, so that comes from my experience uh, in innovation and my intent is actually to increase capability and have greater mission impact as quickly as possible and um, so looking at this, what's the continuum in all of this? How do, how do you actually, in, in a place that's almost totally devastated, you say, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a whiteboard as far as what to do and how to do. It's, it's great. It's a white canvas because uh, when we went to Puerto Rico, for example, we visited 10 uh, communities trying to help them understand a process in which what are your challenges, what are your assets, what is the future, and it's very hard for them to imagine a future. And, uh, because everything was so devastated and it's devastated. just destroyed. You no, know, and we just have to hug them and cry with them. Uh, there's people that says, you know, the, as little as we gave them, th there was just hope. And their response was, we will pray for you for the rest of our lives twice a day. Yeah, and the whole thing about it too is the fact is that you were there. Yes, sir. It was very hands-on in all this. And we're looking at this photograph here as far as the computers yeah. are concerned. Yeah. And you're saying, you know, there's no electricity, everything is destroyed. Why are you okay. starting to bring in, in no. computers? Okay. But you were also uh, doing solar and many yeah. other things, too. Yes, sir. Tell us about that. Yes, sir. So um, we connected through People Center Internet with VA Star, a great organization, and they uh, donated 40 computers for Puerto Rico and we do donated computers to 10 different communities, and then we started two innovation labs in Puerto Rico. Um, 
although I, that's just a down payment on the future because we believe that this is going to happen. And what started has aid has shifted to building capacity. Okay, I've been to Puerto Rico 12 times, more than mm. 120 days. My so uh, there has been progress. It started with the damage, delivering aid, now it's creating opportunities for employment. Now, you're meeting with uh, government officials, uh, communities yes, of faith, uh, educators, and all that. So starting with the government officials, what was their feedback to you and what were, what were the sense that you were getting and then how were you able to take that into okay. the people themselves and start bringing these solutions that you're talking about? Okay. Government officials in Puerto Rico from the top down, I'm going from the bottom up. I'm empowering communities. I basically almost avoid government officials. Uh, nothing bad against them, but you look at you need to look at the internet model. Uh, this year, 50% of the people uh, in the world will be connected to the internet. That means the government, uh, industry, um, uh, people that live in cities, the people that can afford it, but there are many marginalized people, mm -hmm. people that live in isolated areas. You know, we need um, the handicapped, the poor, in many countries, women. You know, how do we innovate new models? Let's do that in Puerto Rico, and let's Wi-Fi the way to the future there. Yeah, and the whole thing about it, I was reading some of the articles that actually has been about you mm, and you. some of the articles you were uh, writing about solar energy and wind and all these other things yeah. and bringing it in. And so you had many isolated areas. All of a sudden, they had more than people down in, you know, in the capital city and, yeah. and the central cities. So it was interesting how you were using, uh, again, the uh, Koki itself. You were leaping yeah. into these communities. Yeah. So the communities of faith, how are they helping out? And we're um, almost out of time. Yes, sir. Um, Puerto Rico has more churches per square miles than any place in the world. Mm -hmm. So if I am going to activate communities, those are communities that the, the, com the people trust. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to activate them. So I started working then with the Department of Commerce and they sent a representative in May and then that led to identifying problem sets in agriculture, um, ocean economy, uh, helping the hearts, minds, and soul of the people, and also construction. And we have, um, we did a second trip two weeks ago, led by the White House, and multiple, uh, multiple, like six different federal agencies um, sent the personnel there. They met with the governor, they met with the church leaders in the whole We're island. running out of time. What do you see for the next five, 10, or 15 years for Project Koki and as well as the people-centered internet. We've got to be quick. Innovation in not just Puerto Rico. We are going to take these models that we innovate in Puerto Rico and lift Latin America from poverty. That's absolutely fantastic. This is Melvin uh, Mel Cordovan. He's the founder, President uh, Koki, as we create the Emerald Planet. So I just moved in with his family, and it's embarrassing. The little one, he likes to go outside and crawl around in the giant litter box. I don't know what he's doing. I mean, I was born and I knew how to use the litter box. Look at that. That's disgusting. Oh, poop already. You're making me nervous. Oh, okay, I can't look at this anymore. I really hope he grows out of this, for his sake. So how was work? It was 1,300 hours. My math class from 302 was in the trenches. Davy Roth had it the worst. Fractions were coming at him left and right. He just didn't get the damn things. Two days ago, I tried to teach him what one fourth of one half was using different sizes of blocks. Yesterday, I tried again by dividing up pizza. Both missions failed. Oh no. But today, I was ready. I created a combat math game where the only way to beat the enemy is to outfraction them. Davy conquered every last denominator. My game was so successful, the principal is deploying it to math squadrons all over the school. Anywho, how was your day? Oh, uh, today my boss treated the office to salad wraps. Hmm, <laughs> salad wraps. I know. 150 over 90. 180 over 111. 160 over 110. I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure looks like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from invisible or silent. 
If you've come off your treatment plan, get back on it or talk with your doctor to create an exercise, diet, and medication plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhbp.org. If I would have followed a treatment plan, I would not be in this situation. To the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and thank you for being with us as we're looking around the globe for those thousand best practices, technology, services, products, processes, and the people, of course, that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And we're talking about how we're going to be able to take care of a planet of 9 billion people by 2050 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century. And we have two people that are joining us that are actually not only thinking about this, but actually doing the research, the development, and practical applications. First is Dr. Susie A. Crate. She is a professor of anthropology, Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason University. She's coming in by Skype. And our uh, good buddy is here. This is Dr. Linton Wells II, coordinator for Star Tides program executive advisor for the C4I and the Cyber Center at the uh, Vogeno uh, School of Engineering at George Mason University. So welcome back, Lynn. Thank you. Glad to have you with me. And uh, she goes by Susie. Susie, are you here? Yes, I am. Uh, welcome. Glad to have you with Thank us. Thank you. Thank you for being Good here. Good to be here. Say, uh, tell us a little bit about your work as the professor of uh, anthropology in the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason University? Well, uh, it's not that different from other professors' work. I do a combination of research, teaching, and service. Um, I, it is an interdisciplinary department. Yeah. We are located in the College of Science. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fantastic what you're doing. We're going to get into uh, some very unique places that you've been traveling over a number of years, and uh, people will be seeing some of the, uh, the information about that. But uh, being a George Mason, tell us what attracted you about George Mason and having the opportunity to set up and uh, really uh, develop your own curricula and, have, and take this interdisciplinary approach. Uh, well, I was offered a job. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty straightforward. But uh, after I got there, I discovered that there was a lot of opportunity uh, to do what I believed in, which was interdisciplinarity. Yeah, that's, um, that's fantastic. What is the connection between uh, anthropology and environmental science and policy? And why is it important to, to combine these? Well, the connection is everything, because if you think about it, humans are the culprits. We are the creators of environmental issues, and we are also the ones who have the ability to set them right. Anthropology is critical because we uh, are cultural beings, and a lot of the behaviors the perceptions, the understandings that we have are based on culture. So it takes anthropology to get in there and to tease out all those nuances, to understand how to get people to change their behaviors, how to get people to understand that climate change is real, et cetera. Yeah, and looking at this, uh, we're going to be showing some photographs from uh, Siberia and Russia. Uh, it's a very interesting place. I've been there and I say I've never seen grass in Russia because I've only been there in the dead of winter and uh, some of these photographs are the same thing. But Lynn, I think you have the next question. Yes, well Susie, I just wondered what is the focus of your research and what drew you to this topic? Well, I began to do this geographic area in northeastern Siberia in 1991 and I've been doing research there ever since. I uh, started looking at the way that their annual festival had changed as a result of history over the Soviet period. And then actually a few weeks after I got back from my research, the Soviet Union fell and suddenly it was the post-Soviet period. Mm -hmm. 
In the process of doing that research, I learned about the environmental issues of this area. This is where 95% of Russia's diamonds come from. And like other industrial activities in the Soviet period, there were absolutely no environmental controls on that diamond processing, which went into the watershed. There were all kinds of issues. And then after a while, I, I got interested in working on issues of sustainability, of, of you know, asking the questions that were really on my mind when I first went there, uh, which were uh, more about um, how people adapted to a, the, the sudden fall of the Soviet Union, uh, which for them um, meant that their state farms were suddenly not existing, and it was really up, up to themselves to find work and to feed themselves. Yeah, and looking at this in, uh, this town industrial site, also it shows you the uh, envir environmental challenges that they have there. So why was it so important to be in Siberia? I mean, there's uh, a million points on the planet that you could go and uh, would be in some ways more hospitable, but yet Siberia has a special place and it is a very important uh, area. So why is it important to study there for not only Russia, but also for the world? Sure. Um, let me just tell you what this picture is. This is not where I do research. This is farther north of where I do research. This is closer to the Arctic Ocean. And I included this as one of the photos just to demonstrate the issues that they're having with flooding. This picture is 10 years ago. Um, so why Siberia? For me personally, I ended up doing research in Siberia from my own wanderlust uh, as a younger researcher, uh, I went to Russia uh, in the 87-88 uh, New Year's. It was the millennium, a thousand years of orthodoxy in Russia. I thought it was going to be a one-time trip. I got bitten by the bug and went back and learned language. And then I learned about Lake Baikal, uh, the deepest, oldest lake in the world, and I found a way to get there. And after working in Buryatia and Tuva and in Mongolia for several years, I was invited up to the Saha Republic for this festival and decided to study that for my folklore degree. Now looking at- Why Siberia specifically? Well, I feel like it chose me, mm -hmm. not that I chose it. Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Looking at the research work you're doing at George Mason University- Are you still there? I. I'm yeah, very much so. <laughs> okay, I wasn't uh, sure because the Skype kind of went out a few times. Just wanted to make sure. uh, as far as uh, George Mason University, looking at it, how does that, that fit into the university's sustainability initiatives, and how can you marry up what you're learning and seeing and experiencing in Russia, that bring it right back to Virginia and the campus at George Mason University? Well, obviously, I can do that with my teaching. Uh, through my classes right now. I'm teaching a graduate course on anthropology and climate change. Uh, and by the way, I just want to mention that, okay, maybe it's going to change. Uh, um, and I must say that in uh, 2005, it was my energy and another professor, Dave Kiebrick, who's in the English department, who organized the first Earth Day at George Mason, uh, after which uh, we developed a, a group on campus. And a few years later, uh, they hired a, we, we pushed the administration to hire a sustainability coordinator. And uh, it's been history ever since. So in, in many ways, my experiences in Siberia, my ability to go to Siberia and to see the changes that were there uh, and to come home and try to bring an awareness of what was going on there to my campus to get George Mason to start walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Yeah. Uh, looking at all this, this is absolutely gorgeous territory, uh, but I think you have the next question, Lynn. First one, in what other sustainability research you involved with George Mason and why those topics? Well, I'm Involved in local sustainability, I'm on the Fairfax City uh, Environmental Sustainability Committee. I've been on this committee for six or seven years trying to work on local issues. 
I really uh, was touched by Melvin Cordova's presentation on Puerto Rico. Uh, I think his presentation really emphasized something that I think is also critically important, is that many of the solutions to the issues that we're facing and we're going to continue to face are local. And we need to build our local communities and build our resilience or our capacity to work together and to uh, you know, respond mm -hmm. when, when emergencies happen, which are going to occur more and more. What are uh, we if looking I could just tell you what these pictures are, these are pictures in the villages in Siberia. These are specifically pictures that show how the degrading permafrost is what it's looking like. So these are once flat areas uh, that are falling and rising because uh, the permafrost in this place, in this ecosystem, uh, has large ice wedges in it, which when they warm, either fall and create valleys or rise and create uh, peaks. Uh, and there's over 35 types of permafrost in this one relatively small area of, of Siberia. So as you can see, like most things with climate change, it's complex. Yes, absolutely. Looking at the, the research that you're doing, uh, you're talking with your uh, colleagues here, you're bringing this information back, you're sharing it. So how are you able to disperse this information, make more people aware, and also to involve others in the research that you've been doing at George Mason? In several ways. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind, uh, I'm collaborating on several uh, research projects. Uh, second, I'm in a documentary film on climate change called The Anthropologist, which not only travels to my research site in northeastern Siberia, but also to two other areas of the world. So if in northeastern Siberia we're seeing the high latitude uh, story of climate change with the ice melt permafrost in this case. We also go to Kiribati in the South Pacific in the documentary and we talk to communities who are being affected by sea level rise. And finally we go to uh, the Peruvian Andes to uh, talk to communities who are being affected by the glacial melt. Susie, we're uh, running out of time so I've got one last question. Uh, what, what are these eyes seeing as far as climate change change in society and the impact and this interaction between environment and humans in Siberia that we need to be aware of uh, for the eastern part of the United States and we got about 20 seconds to do that. Well, uh, people should just understand that climate change is affecting us. Uh, it's, it's complex. Uh, it's wrapped up in a lot of other changes that are going on. It's not coming at us just as climate change, it's making, as we know, hurricanes This is Dr. Susie Crate, Professor Extreme. of Anthropology, George Washington University, James Madison, as we create the Emerald Planet. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. Every time I try to flex Big responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. And the salary. Oh my goodness, yes. 
I right. mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents, and <laughs> right before, the, yeah, so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, what did you? To the Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. and the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for the thousand best practices, technology, services, and products that make a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we engage the next generations to be very much involved in where we're going, as we add about 2 billion more people, yes, 2 billion more people to the planet, how are we going to take care of all these people? And at the same time, how are we going to engage the very young population that's around the globe? And if you look at the continent of Africa, it's almost 60% are considered young people, 30 and under. And I have two who are from George Mason University that are doing outstanding work and actually thinking about the things that we're talking about and how we're going to take care of the food, the fuel, the fiber, everything that's going on around the, uh, the world. And at the same time as to how we're going to house, educate, provide health care and all that. Uh, we're going to give you two examples today. And I've got two people here, Michael Schindler. Uh, he's going to talk about the, his two different organizations he was a part of at George Mason University. And then I have uh, Sharman uh, Hussein, who is a systems engineering student, also working with Star Tides. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, also at George Mason University. But we're going to be talking about water, and you're going to see it in two entirely different ways. Still water, but yet uh, we're dealing with it in ways that we need to be thinking about it for the future. Uh, Michael, why don't you introduce the two professional associations you are very active in there, and we're going to show uh, some of the uh, innovative work that actually came out of what you were doing. Thank you, Sam. So the two organizations that I'm involved in, um, the first one would be Engineers for International Development, which is a very unique student organization. Um, not only are the students working on international projects, but they're also working locally. They um, have recently built a bridge on the Appalachian Trail and last year traveled to Nicaragua to build a water supply system for an orphanage. Um, these students gain leadership experience. The students uh, are getting hands-on experience um, working on real-life projects all the way from the planning stage to um, design stage all the way to implementation. So it's a very unique um, opportunity for these students. And it's not uncommon that the industry will hire students directly out of EFID. Yeah, But let's go to your project here. This is something that deals with water. Yes. And we're also using a waste product. Everybody thinks all this is being recycled. It really isn't. Mm -hmm. And you're going to tell us about that. What are we looking at here in these piles? And then we're going to talk about what you're doing. We're going to intersect with uh, Bangladesh of all places mm -hmm. and see what's happening there. And then uh, just kind of weave this as a narrative. Mm -hmm. but yes. What are we looking at? So on this picture, you can see a mound of glass in um, its, its recycled form, you could say. Um, the uh, Fairfax County has recently acquired a glass crusher to get rid of a issue that they're having because contrary to the popular belief, recycled glass is not being reused to create new glass. Currently it goes straight to the landfill after being incinerated. So we've been approached to find solutions and we came up with two. First of which would be um, using this media as a filter uh, don't, in, in a don't filter. Give your, don't give your uh, secret away. We're no, gonna, we're, we're not. Gonna get we're to not. That in a minute. We haven't patented it yet. Um, so we're using this as filter media and the students have found out that if testing for turbidity that the crushed glass filter is actually superior to traditional sand filter. 
Yeah, that's absolutely fantastic. Charmin, you've been working uh, very uh, eagerly with the Star Tides. Yes. What is Star Tides, and why do you find that as a student it's important not only to be doing your coursework and getting your, your advanced degree, right. but also to have very hands-on practical experience? So Star Tides is a global knowledge sharing research network, and what I'm doing as a part of Star Tides is I'm head of advertising, so I will be trying to reach out to as many students on campus as possible to really show them what Star Tides is and get them involved as much as possible. And so I think it's important to be a student leader, especially among all my peers, is to really allow them to know what Star Tides is and so we can band together, you know, as like the younger generation, we're seen as the future. So I really feel like as, you know, a star leader, we can all you know, get involved and, you know, try to cause that impact and all that change. And also really um, will allow me to, you know, prepare from the workforce right after school ends. And I will use the new knowledge that I obtained from Star Tides and the new um, experience and it will really help me prepare for my you know, major in systems engineering. Yeah, and the whole thing about this, you're in systems engineering, and we're going to talk about that yes. in the context of uh, your, your uh, ancestral country. But also, you're meeting many people that have very innovative uh, technologies mm -hmm. in a way they can move forward, and many of these can be applied in, you know, back in your ancestral country of Bangladesh yes. and many others. We'll talk about that. But Michael, why was it important as far as you were concerned to be involved with these uh, two professional development associations. You had one which of course was the engineers and the other one is dealing with, really with environmental and water resources. Yeah, so the second organization I'm involved with is the Virginia Water Environment Association. And this is a, a professional organization that focuses on water and wastewater applications. And we are as students competing on a national um, level uh, for uh, GMU VWA at the moment. And we're getting ready to compete um, against uh, um, other universities um, from all across the United States in New Orleans. Yeah. And uh, looking at this equipment, uh, this is something, uh, this is all part of this project. And people would think about your students and they're doing small things and, and all that. But actually, this is, this is a very large project. And so uh, having this connection with uh, Fairfax County yes. allowed you the resources, the equipment and all that to do it. What are you actually learning from that, still being in school, mm -hmm. but yet projecting forward as a professional in this area? How has that really helped you? So I gained a whole lot of leadership experience um, during those projects. I learned how important it is to be connected with other industry professionals. We posted a video highlighting the issue that Fairfax County has and shortly thereafter we were contacted by in industry professionals um, asking for this resource. So what I have learned and what I will be using uh, going forward from here on is that networking is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this whole thing, Charmin, I know this is what you're learning, uh, particularly the work you're doing with Star Tides. Not only are you trying to communicate with the students, but mm -hmm. also all these adults, these professionals right. that are coming <laughs> on, they're professors, they're uh, innovators, they're inventors, they're entrepreneurs, right. all of that is coming in. You're learning all that. But we're, we're looking at something now, dealing with water, it's very different than what we uh, normally see here, although you know there are storms that we have in the United States is doing this. But Bangladesh is, is blessed and cursed both with water. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> so uh, looking at this, why is it, why do you have this duality as far as water is concerned, particularly in Bangladesh? I mean, Bangladesh is right on the border of South Asia, uh, South Asia so you know it was, it's a blessing because you know the fishing industry is thriving, but it's also a curse because of all the flooding that ruins all our already known um, infrastructure, which is already poor, and all the families that are living in small villages. And so, when the flooding occurs, you know, not many families are able to live s safely. Yeah, and uh, looking at this, we saw, you know, downtown, a, a major city, and then we're looking out in the countryside, uh, you know, and I was uh, there just uh, some years ago, and uh, I was asked by a director of the United Nations to look across the street. This is in Dhaka, the capital mm -hmm. city. And what do you see? And I said, well, that looks like a very busy street to me. Right. He says, by 2050, that's where the Bay of Bengal is going to be. 
50 million people in your home country will be displaced. 50 oh, wow. million people. Uh, almost a third of the whole population mm -hmm. is going to be displaced. So we're, we're seeing all this, and this is happening, and that's why I think the work you're doing with Star Tides is so critically important as you learn and grow. But looking at the work that you're doing, how is this? Now we're going to the other side of water, you know, the blessing side of all this. But yet you have a medium here that's mm -hmm. actually a real waste. Yes. It's a real problem. It costs a lot of money to process. Mm -hmm. Now you're turning it into something useful. How did you... How did you do that. So uh, you can see on the picture here uh, the entirely student-built uh, Filter Master 5000. Um, the students came up with that name. And you can also see the initial sample in the beaker. It's quite turbid. And the other two samples that you can see are after they've been filtered. Mm -hmm. You can't really see a difference um, between the two samples. One was filtered with um, the traditional sand uh, media and the other with the crushed glass media. And you only see a difference if you look at the samples with the turbidity meter. And we found out, like I mentioned before, that the glass was superior to it. Mm -hmm. And so you're taking something really was a pure waste. It was uh, really hard to get yes. rid of. It was very expensive, mm -hmm. and turning it into something that's quite valuable. Yes, exactly. And of course, there's what millions of tons of glass over the whole country. You know, there the is, planet would be billions of tons. Exactly. And I think this is what is very important for this research is that it is not only beneficial to Fairfax County, but this is a problem all across the United States. Yeah, and going back to uh, Bangladesh, and we're just about out of time, uh, Sharman, but what are you learning as far as uh, being in the degree program at George Mason University? And you have this zeal that you want to go back and, and help at home. Of course. So what do you see, and we got to be quick. Okay, so I'm currently a systems engineering major, and what that is is basically the design and management of complex systems. And so what Star Tides is, it's a complex system. And through Star Tides, like, I'll be able to figure out how, who, is our, who are we reaching, and who are we helping, what are the functions that we have to undergo, and what is the impact that we want to have. And so that will allow me, through Star Tides, to really spread awareness and you know, come back with a high success rate for the projects taken on in Bangladesh to make them successful for the people who live there. Michael, we're running out of time. We're going to put this up about this uh, water, the waste to filtered water. How do you see Star Tides and your degree from George Mason University really preparing you for the future to do good things? We've got about 20 seconds to do all that. So I believe that working with Star Tides, we can use their platform to share the knowledge that we acquired in our research and that this will benefit um, less, uh, less fortunate people and the whole world. Yeah, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Michael Schindler uh, at George Mason University, also Sharman Hussein, systems engineering student at George Mason University as we're looking around the globe and taking and creating the Emerald Planet. Nice work. Thank you for being with us. Michael, thank you for being back. 